I constantly press against the norm by being who I am. I have been mistreated and misjudged in the small town in which I was raised. There have been occasions where society has overlooked my humanity. I am nothing. What you wish you could be, but can't. My name is Natasha Cornett. I'm what is considered a freak. County authorities are investigating a shooting that claimed four victims, including two children. Natasha Holiday, she said, oh, Mom, we're going to go to a motel, so we're going to have a party there. That's, that's what the kid, kids did. It's just like our little teenage getaway. They get a big gang together and pitch money in, you know, and go someplace where they could be, I guess, themselves. We were old enough to rent the room. We'd rent a room, get some beer, and get drunk, and that's about it. Just, you know, have a good time, but, I mean, sometimes a fight would break out or something, you know, but that's between friends, you know, nothing major, just typical teenage stuff. Unable to adapt to uh, society as it is, uh, they're going to protest. And they protest sometimes in the most horrendous ways. So some of the things that they do are shocking uh, and, uh, and unacceptable to the mainstream of society. I don't know what they did at the motel, but it, you know, some people make it sort of gory. <laughs> They'd all went out, I believe it was Friday. We got a key to room seven. I just know there was some cut. And Natasha and Karen was cutting on each other's arms. Crystal was there, Jason was there, and Joe and Karen. The, the, tried to burn 666 into the floor. Holly Motel deal, they stretched that way out of proportion. My, my opinion, you know, and there wasn't no 666 burnt in no carpet. I know I was the first one in that room, <laughs> besides the manager. There were people in the group that just decided they wanted to mess up the hotel room, so they did. You told us about the Collie Motel. You said that you saw what kind of activities taking place there. Um, they had candles out, uh, razor blades, a Ouija board. Natasha and I like talked about committing suicide. It was happenstance uh, that they met the Lily Lit family out here in Bailenton at the rest stop. Vidar was uh, from Norway, and then uh, Delfina was from uh, Miami, Florida. They met in Miami and uh, got married, and then they moved because of uh, him wanting to get away from the, the violence down there in, in Florida. He wanted to go to a little bit more peaceful area. He was the bus boy there at the Holiday Inn there on Cedar Bluff. Basically worked part-time, and uh, they just got by uh, the best they could. They were members of uh, Jehovah's Witness. Uh, and uh, very, very involved in their church. And in fact, had been up to a uh, convention in Johnson City. That was the one-day assembly that we were having April 6th. And uh, so we were going to Johnson City to uh, receive encouragement from the Bibles where we hear uh, Bible talks at the convention to how we can better uh, serve God and encourages us to, uh, you know, stay faithful to the ministry and doing God's will. We always tried to help him in any way we could as far as financially or just give him money to help him get gas, money to pioneer and things, because we knew that, uh, you know, he needed some help sometimes. And I think a lot of the people did. There were a lot of friends that he had that were like that that were willing to help him. They were church-going good people. We usually went out afterwards and ate at a restaurant. Uh, but at that time, I think that they just... Uh, Got some new clothes that come to the same, which is sort of unusual because <laughs> they usually didn't have new clothes. Couldn't eat up there because with everybody else because they didn't have the money. 
They were just going to go out, have a picnic, and, and eat their lunch. They were going back to Knoxville. Had stopped at the Bailton Rest Stop. I think they were proselytizing. I really couldn't understand him. He had a pretty thick accent. And I was like, he was talking about God or something like that. And he said, would you like to learn more about God? And I was like, well, yeah, you know, sure. And I think that that focused their attention on the family. That may not have been focused before. If they had just come in to the rest area, used the bathroom, walked out and left. The whole thing I got out of it is that, you know, bad things happen to good people in this world. And, and it doesn't make any sense, but you see it all the time on TV that that um, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time, you can end up dead. What I would think is playing a role in terms of the fact that the family was Jehovah's Witness is that it probably influenced the perceptions of those kids. That is, the kids probably perceived the family not as, as, as separate individuals as mom, dad, and, and son and daughter, um, but probably perceived them at a group level and kind of just saw them as just one big lump and didn't differentiate, didn't see them um, as, as, as humans, in a sense, as individuals. I remember Tabitha acting kind of scared of me and Natasha. And uh, I smiled at her, and that's when she gave Natasha and I those little Hershey kisses. I said to Joe and Jason, let's just go. From that point on, I was kind of put in a very odd situation where I didn't know what to do. You know, it's like you don't want to believe that a person is actually capable of committing harm, but at the same time, you're afraid that he is. They might not have... Uh you know, differentiated between different sects of religion, and they saw the Jehovah's Witnesses just being Christians, as being a symbol of those who have, and who put them in the position of being have-nots. Joe Reisner went over there and, and kidnapped him. I walked to the car, I opened up the back door, and Dean was sitting in the back seat. I think he was smoking a cigarette. And I looked at him and I said, they're gonna do something, and just be ready. And I grabbed a gun, um, which was a nine millimeter. I put on my sweater and I put the gun like down in my pants. And I walked up to the picnic table where everyone was sitting. They were out to steal a van. Why'd you need that bigger car for? Because um, we did. We, we need a bigger car because we all couldn't fit in that uh, blue car. It's too small, and plus um, the blue car would not make it. And then that's when you decided to go get another. They came back, and Joe pulled out the long millimeter and said, I'm sorry about this. Everybody just be quiet, and nothing's going to happen to you. All we need is the van. And at that point, everybody kind of stood up, and we all started going down to the van. We started to get in. And I asked Natasha, you know, whether I should, should, do you want me to drive? And she said, no, just go ahead and let him drive. And uh, we all got into the van. He said, everyone stay calm. We're just going to take a little ride. No one will get hurt. They went out and got in the van and took off. And they followed him in their car. Got back on the Interstate 81 going south. It just goes about maybe a mile or two. You hit the bail at the exit. Hang a right off the belt and exit. Go straight up Van Hill Road, maybe a mile, and you turn left on the Payne Hollow Road, which gives the appearance to someone unfamiliar with the area of being a, you know, a very underpopulated place. Just went up there maybe, I don't know, a um, couple of hundred yards, parked, got them out of the car, out of the van. Probably not in their wildest imaginations could they consider what was about to happen to them. They would have had confidence that God, um, as the source of, of life and power and energy, and indeed the source of all good, namely a powerful good, in the presence of evil, would certainly uh, be present uh, to make possible a constructive outcome. We got to where we turned off on Pain Hollow, and Mr. Lilla had said, like, here and I was like yeah sure and we turned off there Joe tells everybody to get out of the van and we all get out Joe and Jason walked like away from us and 
the family was standing together, like on the side of the road. I remember Natasha like trying to make Jason promise not to hurt the little kids. And she was like going up to Fadar and Delfina saying that I can't stop this. Just let me have the kids so they won't be hurt. And Vidar says something like, if we die, they'll be dead too. And Jason was asking Joe, what do you think we should do? Do you think we should let him go? Or do you think we should kill him? And Joe said, oh no man, what do you think that we should do? And he said, I think we should kill him. You can sort of imagine uh, the surprise if one was expecting witnessing to have a positive result and for it to have so radical a negative consequence. Fedor took out his wallet and said, just take our money and take the van, just don't hurt us. Who did you give the wallet to? Jason. Jason was standing in front of them pointing the gun and I was standing beside him. Was that the 25? He, I don't know which gun he was pointing at that. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was the 25 because I had the nine millimeter. He did a series of shots? Yes. Did you see who he shot? You said he shot Vladar first, of course. Yes. What I happened after that? He just like started shooting everybody. Vladar and Delfina. Vladar, dead lead, was shot in the right eye. And I think the uh, son, Peter, was shot in the right eye. One of the witnesses heard uh, gunfire and the sound of uh, children playing. That was Mr. Gaby. Well, obviously, it's not the lily led children who are laughing and playing. They're being shot. I just got a contract to build this road and the tank site. And uh, it was one Sunday afternoon. It was uh, late in the day. Um, wasn't quite dark yet. Uh, I walked up here to uh, look at the job, and uh, I heard a gunshot over to my right. I didn't think a lot about it. Uh, it's not unusual for people to shoot, you know, either hunting or uh, target shooting. Then there was a pause. I could hear, could hear a dog barking. Um, I could hear like, uh, sound like children on a playground at a distance. It wasn't over quickly. Yeah, you know, it took some it took some time. You know, the first shot, I, I was kind of startled. Maybe stopped for just a second, then I continued walking. Maybe five, between five and ten seconds, I heard another shot. Large caliber gun. I heard another shot, and I saw Mrs. Lilla turn to her side, and she fell to the ground. What did you do? <laughs> I jumped into the van and I closed the, closed the door and I started to cry. And my first thought when the door closed, I heard like a, started to hear like a burst go off. And I thought, oh my God, they're dead. The attack claimed the lives of Vidar and Delfina Lilylid and their six-year-old daughter Tabitha. Tonight, the only survivor, two-year-old Peter, continues to slowly improve. He is in serious but stable condition at UT Hospital after being shot in the head. I met Roger. You know, I was at at that time, I guess a good a good uh, catch or something of the freedom. She was working in a, a store downtown, and I was working the street all the time, and we just got talking, and one thing led to another. I wanted to have his baby. I've always been a loner. And uh, I never did like married life. He perked me up and made me feel better and made me feel more like a woman and everything. But then I got pregnant. There's just so much uh, that starts before Natasha was born that has a lot to do with how Natasha is today. She done good in the grades. She won trophies and she won ribbons and so forth. Everything was fine. Her clothes had to be just perfect. She dressed, you know, the little preppy 
clothes and then all of a sudden in the 28th and 9th grade, all preppiness went away. Her going into high school was really a bad experience for her. When she went in as a freshman, she had this problem with this one girl that just constantly was bug her and call her freak. And then I think the principal, he even got in on the freak business too. Yeah, I transferred to schools like three or four times. I felt like I was being judged for not who I was, but who everybody perceived me to be. And I was being judged harshly by everyone. And so I sought out people that had been ostracized, you know, for one reason or another, from the same people that were condemning me. And that's how I pretty much got associated with the wrong crowd. So I think it's the best thing that can happen is for Natasha to change schools. I mean, this was the way they were getting rid of the problem. She said something one time about going to principal over something, and uh, they told her she needed to change her appearance if she wanted people to leave her alone. Yeah. And it's like the way they dress, the, their pant legs were, okay, that was before the bell bottoms ca came back in. And they, their jeans, they wore them real low, and, or they wore army fatigues. And it's like, they were noticed. Antisocial behavior is a key. Whatever can be done which is antisocial, which is anti-establishment, <laughs> uh, is attractive uh, to uh, young people who are looking for ways to find their, themselves and their own identities. Something effective, just, just why do you dress like that? You know, why, why would you want to do that? They call her a freak and I mean, throw stuff at her. I mean, it was just, it was outrageous. I wouldn't think that it was anything that was a, a major harassment, though, because, again, if I thought it was to that extent, I would have thought that one of our teachers would have picked up on it and something would have been done about it. Kids are mean. Kids are mean. They are the real mean at school, you know. And whenever you have one that's not as smart as you or, you know, not wearing as nice as clothes as you or something like that, you know, they, they, they get picked on. They're the ones that get picked on. The difficulty is how to discern that to be the case early enough that there is intervention at a point where constructive results can occur before uh, violence will erupt. Anybody that was different in the least little way ended up having to drop out of school just because of so many cliques. I wanted to do something with my life. You know, I didn't want to just sit around and do drugs until I was 50. I didn't want that for myself. I wanted something, but it's like, Every time that I try to acquire something, you know, in school or whatever, every time that I try to take a step towards a positive direction, it's like I got pushed down. I got put off. There's the popular crowd. There's the have-nots, the haves and the have-nots. And if you perceive yourself as being a have-not, in your mind you might also perceive there being a group of haves. You know, those who have it, and I'm in the group that don't have it. Everybody who ever went to school knows that they had a group of kids that they felt more comfortable around, which I call cliques, so to speak. Some of them are larger than others, but I think all kids tie into people they have common interests with. She could find the kids who had low self-esteem, and whatever it was she did, she could make them feel a part of something. She was like the only person around that time that actually had the nerve, you know, to dress to the be, way she to be herself. They were noticed because they looked different. Concert t-shirt on and the baggy jeans. You know, there's lots of factors that influence whether people come together and feel like a group, but having um, common experiences and common backgrounds definitely plays a role. Each one of us in our own way have been abused or something or another in certain ways, and we just all connected in that form. If anything, we're more, they call it, you know, we call it the little sisterhood, but it's because, you know, we didn't have anybody else. 
we just all had each other. So, I mean, that was just the way that we connected together. All of those kids um, shared a similar background of being alienated, being bullied, being rejected, being taunted. And that shared experience could easily serve as a, uh, a kind of a springboard for them getting together and feeling as a group and wanting to take care of one another. I feel utterly alone. Now there is no part of myself I do not doubt. I've never felt as low as I do now. She had problems where she had that chemical imbalance, wasn't it? Or something. She just, we kind of had to watch out for her because she was real naive. She was manic depressive, bipolar. Bipolar disorder is a description of a mood disorder in which people will range from highs to lows. There are exceptions where some people will range between being depressed as opposed to being angry and agitated. Just like right here, this is one Natasha, and over here is this other Natasha. I'm afraid of when she's here. At times, I'd sit up at night and sleep during the day. Because I was a teenager, and teenagers by nature have a lot of ups and downs. And I was a teenager trying to survive through a very turbulent life um, the best way that I could and retain my sanity. And that's the only thing that was ever wrong with me. And what I tried to explain to counselors is they could give me medication, but that's not gonna change my life. It's not going to make my mother not be me or, you know, it's not going to fix anything because I was just a kid trying to survive. As far as uh, bipolar disorder is concerned, you see people being predominantly uh, depressed and then go into periods of elation, euphoria, uh, being very, very high emotionally. Or they will be the kind of person who is up all of the time and then will suddenly go into the depths of depression, stay there for a while, and then circle back around to um, being up again. I was afraid she'd stick me with a knife or something. I hid the knives and hid the guns. She didn't know that she was going to go into the hospital. She thought she was just trying it, going to go there and look. But uh, I put her in, in her not knowing. Him. The psychiatrists and counselors in my town were a joke. What was your understanding that, that the doctor said was wrong with you? They told me I was bipolar. That's all they said. Okay, did they explain that to you at all? Uh-uh. Did they uh, uh, tell you what to, to do to, to stop that? Did they give you any medication? <coughs> any kind of treatment? They gave me medication, but it didn't work. Okay, what kind of medication? Um, Prozac and lithium. They weren't concerned about what was going on in my life or talking to me about my problems. You know, it's just get them in, get them out. When she left, they told me that, said that she needed to stay longer, that she wasn't okay, that probably there would be, you know, worse things that would happen to her because she was still a troubled child. But, you know, I couldn't afford to keep her in the hospital and uh, Medicaid wouldn't pay anymore. They paid for 11 days and that was it. Years ago, we had people staying for a month in, in a psychiatric facility. Today, they've gone to the exact opposite extreme and if you can get three to seven days, you're very lucky. When we have young people who are this disturbed, the problems are difficult to resolve. The resources of society are not uh, constructively um, channeled to help them. And the result is society uh, lets this kind of young person go its way until there's an eruption, disturbed, just a manifestation of pathology uh, that we find totally unacceptable. So you have a situation in which there are breakdowns in communication, you have cultural factors both professional and, and in the lay community, and the aggregate of all of this is that these people simply are not getting treated. Or that the treatment is lasting for such an inordinately small amount of time that you're not going to get anything accomplished. It wasn't that she was well that she got released. It was because there was no money. Did you think there was anything wrong with you? Yeah. I mean, I knew it wasn't 
not to be as depressed as I was. I didn't want to die. When you acknowledge that there are social and psychological pathologies in a society, you have to acknowledge that there's something about that society that makes this possible. I whipped her hard. I, I whipped her with my hand. I never, you know, whipped in a belt. But I was at a, a period in my life that I was on the edge. She was on the edge, and nobody was coming in to help on either side. So we just sort of clashed. Their mother, daughter, they had their problems between each other, but they loved each other. She went through an ordeal of mine. She had tried to kill herself. I remember taking six pills, six sleeping pills. I went in there to her bedroom, and I found her laying in the bed with no clothes on. I took a whole bottle. I don't remember it. And I tried to wake her up. And she found where I had got sick. And she went and wake up. I started getting scared. She didn't know what was going on. I didn't want to wake her up because I knew she'd yell at me. So I like sat curled up next to her door. She laid down in the floor at the door of the bedroom. Uh -huh. Yeah. Karen came from a broken home, too, and her mother was very, very religious, and she was real hard on Karen. She had the same basic background as me. Um, she was quiet. I don't know. We shared the same interest. She wasn't a bad person. Karen told me a great deal about her family, about her parents and uh, their interactions and, and uh, the violence that she saw there. My mother's mother uh, had bipolar disorder. I've heard like other family members have had the same mental illnesses. In terms of her relationship with Natasha, you have to take a look at her relationship with her mother. She'd put holy oil on Karen's doors and stuff. She had a variety of, of uh, punishments that uh, she would inflict on Karen. She was convinced that Karen was possessed. Her mother, as punishment, would have her stand on a bottle for inordinate amounts of time. Just tell the court um, how your mother was. It's, it's about your relationship with her. My dad and I and my brother drove over to my mom's house, and her car was parked in the parking lot, parking place, uh, and um, the doors were locked, and... Uh, my dad opened my bedroom window and like pushed me inside of it. And I went into the kitchen and like she was standing there. What was she doing? She was standing on a Bible. And what was she doing on the Bible? I, I don't know. Um, She wasn't doing anything. She like looked at me and told me to get out. This was when you were 11 or 12 years old? Oh, 10 or 11. Karen saw a male therapist at the mental health center. Her home life had affected a lot of her behaviors just from some of the things the kids would say. The impression I got was that his training was such that um, it was in a very esoteric form of psychology. It was not clinical psychology. It was not clinically trained. She was, um, I guess, always waiting for you to criticize her or to um, to correct her for something, to get on her. And, um, and she was always very defensive. Let's talk about your relationship with Natasha Cornett. You and she both heard voices, didn't you? Yes. Male voices. Male and female. She would periodically have a visual hallucination of a man. And this other person was controlling her thinking. Let's talk about those hallucinations for a moment. Okay. Started with snakes. Yes. And then spirits. 
snakes and spirits and demons. Yeah. And then balls of light bouncing off of the walls. Is that correct? Yeah, just little balls of light. We all devil dabbled around in the witchcraft stuff, but nothing ever phenomenal happened. You know, I mean, it wasn't like spirits come floating out of the walls. I only, like, dabbled in it just a few times, not, like, constantly. Do you call one who dabbles in witchcraft a witch? No. We might have done some stupid stuff. When we hung out, we played with the Ouija boards. You know, we did what we did, but we never hurt anyone. What interests me is, what is it that gives people that kind of confidence in the Ouija board? You, how can you have that kind of respect for the validity of a Ouija board consultation? We never really played with the Ouija board like every day or anything. I mean, it wasn't yeah. something that we Once did. every few months or something. Yeah. It kept getting worse, especially when her and Karen was together. It seemed like... Well, they just intertwined somehow. They were so close. Joe was a really sweet guy. I mean, he really was. He was like one of the girls. He hung out with us, like the girls, just him, you know, all the time. And he just never he made an sister. influence. He was yeah. the only guy that was a sister. Yeah, we made him a sister because he just, he was like a girl. Risers by nature are a blue collar honest, hard-working people that believe in education and believe in earning your own way in the, in the world. Um, I wanted to instill that in Joseph. He let us dress him up like a girl and put makeup on him and stuff. I mean, I mean, clearly he had some issues. Your groups definitely have social pressures. People want to fit into the group. They want to feel respected. They want to feel liked. Um, and if you know he, they were dressing up as a girl and he felt belittled by that, maybe he would kind of kind of go overboard in terms of his behaviors to act against that and, and to maybe demonstrate that he's, you know, not a little girl, and that, that maybe in his mind that, you know, behaving aggressively is what a man does. You're Joe's mother. Yeah. I'd like to ask you uh, first whether or not Joe has ever laid eyes on his real father. No, sir. Uh, and that was because you left his real father. Yes, sir. Uh, when I guess you were, what, two months pregnant? Yes, sir. He would know, you know, where to stop when it comes to certain things, you know, and how far to go, you know, I mean, how wrong certain things were. How old were you the first time you ever tried any drugs, and what drugs were those? I think I was 10, and it was like marijuana. And did he do that in your home? Yes, he did, with me. And tell us about that. I wanted him to, I wanted to find out how he was going to react to it when he did smoke it. I wanted to be with him because, you know, some people it doesn't bother. Some people get paranoid. Some people have all different kinds of things with it. And I wanted to know how he'd react. It's not a fact that I'm very proud of, but when money started rolling in, um, in order to, the way I rationalized it, in order to keep up with the grind, I started dabbling in methamphetamines. It got worse, and it kept getting worse, and it kept getting worse. The more money I made, the more I did. He was becoming kind of emotionally um, aggravated at home, and we could tell, I mean, it was like a big kind of a strain on the household. What had, had Joe told you about his relationship with Natasha? That he was a friend, that he liked her, that she had had some abuse in her family, and that they talked to each other. Did he tell you that, that uh, part of the relationship was uh, uh, discussing her problems and his problems and that, that they tried to help each other? Yeah, they did. That's what he told me, that she was a friend. And mainly that he was excited that she had found Dean because she'd found somebody that would be good to her. Her and Dean were doing great. I mean, he was the best thing that happened to her, I thought. You know, he kept her happy. It's the happiest I've seen her in a while. I mean, they were just doing fine. He had a real good home life. His father worked for a heating and air conditioning company. His mother had been employed in a law office uh, here in Pikeville, Kentucky. He, um, he described his home life as, uh, as normal. Uh, and good. He met Miss Cornette and um, his life was changed forever. Jason told me that Joe and Dean shot was the trigger people. 
said, Crystal was totally innocent. Said she didn't do nothing. Said that Natasha and Karen went over the bodies and did satanic things over the bodies. And other than that, I did. I told him I didn't want to know no more. I was scared to death of Jason. I mean, really. Pretty well raised yourself. Is that a pretty close statement? That's pretty close, yes. When did your mom leave? I was either two or three. And your dad stayed drunk most of the time? Yes. Jason just, I don't know, I didn't like him from the get-go. I mean, not trying to bash the little guy, but I just, you get a bad feeling in your stomach when you meet certain people. He was a very well-mannered kid, and with kids, he played real well with kids. Every, everyone liked, liked Jason. You knew what it was like to take things that did not belong to you before these events took place. Yes. He didn't seem that right, I mean, to be honest with you. I don't judge people, but he just seemed like he maybe had problems deeper within than he needed help. He uh, had just about killed an old man in, in Ohio someplace, him and a couple of more of his buddies or something. I think one time at Elkhorn, somebody said, uh, now, it, they said that he pushed a little boy down the stairs, but it didn't happen that way because that I was, that's, I was called to school. And what it was, was they were into, they were arguing and they tripped, both of them tripped down the stairs, so. You're going to counseling because of your school behavior, is that correct? Um, basically, yes. You know what counseling means? Psychological counseling, helping you out mentally. All right, yeah. And I didn't like him and I didn't like Crystal. I just didn't, something about him, I didn't like him. She was She's huffed strange. up all the time. Yeah. You know, just like, just no response from her, you know. She just kind of look at me like, mean like, you know. Crystal and Jason. I don't understand them, and I don't know why they stepped into the picture when they did. But I think it had a lot to do with what happened. I think what happened at the Collie Motel was probably sex, alcohol, blood. We had evidence that they engaged in uh, rituals in which there was blood drinking and uh, sexual activity. I remember Natasha drinking Jason's blood and uh, I think I drank Natasha's blood one time that night. Uh, they would tie their the men down, drink their blood and other juices from the them. It was kind of like it brought us closer together as friends. These uh, kids were involved in the occult and satanic worship. Very small groups uh, of people, maybe five, six, a dozen, uh, are interested in reacting against their dominant social uh, milieu and uh, they developed uh, satanism as um, as a protest. It wasn't anything like that. They just blew everything way out of proportion. They're trying to find um, ways of being in the world where they feel comfortable, where they have a sense of identity and importance and value and continuity, and they do it by developing a protest group, a, a, a satanic group. These are generally very small. Uh, I know they're notable whenever they reach the news, Generally, uh, when they come to the attention of society, it's with a horrible event that spells their demise. You know, that's the end of the group because society will find that kind of behavior uh, not acceptable. Something was wrong. I Something him, wasn't I right to about him. I Sunday on the phone, and I couldn't get Natasha on the phone. For some reason, she was doing something. She was in through the trailer somewhere doing something, and I talked to Karen for a minute. She wasn't very talkative. I talked to Joe for a minute, and he wasn't very talk talkative. And I knew something was wrong, and I was just like, Tell make sure Natasha calls me, you know? Make sure that she calls me. And finally, by the time I called back, they were all gone. 
then left. I think they just had to leave. They knew that they were going to be picked up from for doing whatever they had done at the Collie Motel. I just got a weird, They're... off feeling. You know, usually if you call a place where there's a group of teenagers, there, you know, usually they would be talking about something, laughing, something's going on, you know, they're doing something, but nobody had anything to say. It's dead you know, silent. Everybody was just like real preoccupied. I know something was wrong with the kids when they came back from the Collie Motel because they were just really quiet. They walked in single file again after they had walked out single file. Usually they were all going out the door at the same time, you know, bang, <laughs> banging into each other and everything else. But this was like zombie, you know. Everybody was real quiet. Karen stops and says, the end of time is coming. And I think, okay, they've been into their weirdo stuff again, you know. I thought they'd had the Ouija board out. And who knows? That's where they made their decision to to go to uh, Louisiana, to New Orleans. I think that decision was probably made in the Cotton Motel. I thought that we would go to New Orleans and we would just split up. You know, um, it's a city, it's pretty big. I thought everybody would go their own way, however way that they wanted to go, then that's where they would go. As soon as they left, my dad called the Kentucky State Police, reported him kidnapped kidnapped and they're supposed to put a worldwide bulletin out on him well that never got done okay I called my brother-in-law James Ratliff and he called Kentucky State Police told them and called Virginia uh, State uh, Patrol and because he knows all of the kids and he told me that if he was with Natasha he was in danger they had no business for a gun of course, she had been raped in, in Louisiana, and I always figured that's when they, they wanted the gun to go back to Louisiana. They needed protection. They weren't going out to kill people, though. They weren't on a, a killing spree. Karen said that her dad had a gun. She said that she wanted to go back, but she would never go back unless she had a gun, because she wouldn't be raped again. And that's what the guns were for. They told their friends, was going to be part of our proof, that they look out, look for us. Uh, we're going to be in the news. We're going to go out killing and robbing across the country. They just took a road trip. They left Pikeville uh, in the uh, little blue Chevrolet, cram, cram full. Joe and Natasha and I were up front, and Crystal, Dean, and Jason were in the back seat. By some descriptions, they were painted white. That they had, they were into goth or something. They looked really unusual. They were probably in a hurry to get there because they got a speeding ticket in Virginia right before they got in Tennessee. Drive into Virginia. Yes. Get stopped. Yes, we got pulled over for speeding. I got a ticket. I observed a blue Chevrolet coming southbound and it appeared to be traveling at a high rate of speed. The radar indication I got was that that speed of that vehicle was 74 miles an hour. Jason's dad called the police and uh, alerted them to the fact that Jason was with somebody and they had guns and they were he was on probation and they needed to pick him up. You were on probation? <laughs> yes, sir. Head daddy called the state police. There's just two ways out of there. The state police could have been either place and, uh, you know, stop it. There apparently had not been a, a wanted on it or a uh, bolo to stop that vehicle and hold it out of Kentucky. There was no, you know, all points bulletin out looking for them or anything. Law enforcement uh, is sometimes able to react quickly and Sometimes it's not. I ran the vehicle. There's no wanted or anything on it. He had a valid driver's license. So I issued him a summons for 74 in a 55 speed zone. There was 
just something about the stop and the people that just put me on edge at that time. And I left from the scene there and proceeded on patrol. Kentucky State Police, Virginia State Police, you know, all the police, you know, had been called, had been warned. They could have prevented this. There was just so many things could have stopped it that I don't... But that's water over the bridge or under it or whatever. At that time, all I had was a speeding charge. We were driving along, and Karen said that she had to go to the bathroom. So we pulled off at the rest area. There was an empty space, and then Fedar's van was parked on the empty side of the empty space. They believed in what they were doing, and they were trying to to get others to follow and believe. Vidar and Peter walks up to Natasha and I, and this is how we're doing. Um, told him fine, talked about his denomination, his uh, Jehovah Witness, his church and stuff. The Lily Lid family began to talk to some of the uh, murderers possibly because of the way they appear. You know, they had just been to this meeting. And at that meeting, they no doubt gave expression to their ultimate commitment uh, to this religious understanding. And ultimate commitment to that meant an obedient response to God's command. If God's command is for you to witness, uh, then in the presence... Where do you witness more significantly than in the presence of that which you conceive to be evil? The door. I think asks Natasha if she believes in God. Natasha says, I think, no. I remember her saying that he never did answer her prayers when she was little. He said that he wanted to talk more at a picnic table on this little hill. They went over to some tables over there at the, at the rest area. And the next thing I know, I see him on the nose. And I was like, well, what the hell? 17 shots, all told. The children were placed in a cross over the parents. Got the uh, Chevrolet Cavalier stuck somewhere. Got the van turned around. I believe it was riding or driving the van anyway. As they were coming back up the lane, heading out, he swerved and ran over with the van. I took off, and I turned up like pulled it hard over to the left, like missed my car, and I don't know how long I was there. I mean, I'd never drove a van before, and I didn't want to wreck us. And um, I cut it back real hard right. I think we were like in the ditch or something, I don't know. I cut it back real hard right. And I remember feeling this hit something. They had a ritualistic killing, shooting of them which everybody participated. There was no rituals or anything that was done at the crime scene, as the DA spoke of. I believe that when they killed the lily lids, that they had an, a, an occult purpose, and it was sort of a ritual. These people were murdered to conceal the theft of the van. And I think once they stole it, that uh, then something happened that may be related to... Uh, the satanic aspect of the case that everybody talks about. They were binding or making a bond with the devil. Now, prior to my experience in this case, I might have had a little trouble believing that. I don't think the fact that these people had been somehow involved with Satanism had anything to do with who the victims were because they were Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't think it had anything to do with that. Now, the, the prosecutor may disagree with that. These children were blonde-haired, blue-eyed. We learned later from an occult expert that those types of victims uh, hold a special si significance uh, in with people that uh, worship Satan. They felt like they would get some kind of power. The wounds were geometrically equidistant as the three wounds in the chest. And that couldn't have been done. Um, for instance, I couldn't duplicate that right now with um, 
a piece of cardboard and a weapon. I couldn't do it. I couldn't measure them to be geometrically equidistant. Jason wanted to go to Mexico instead of New Orleans. Jason said that if we go ahead and went to New Orleans, that everybody would know where we went because Natasha's mom knew about New Orleans, her going to New Orleans. And uh, he said if we go to Mexico, that they would, the cops wouldn't be able to get him there. I had no doubt that when we got to the border, we were going to be busted. I mean, there was no doubt in my mind. And, I mean, we needed to be. Why? Because of that sick little bastard and what he done. I mean, we needed to be. Somebody needed to catch us. This is 6 Eyewitness News at 6. We have breaking news to tell you about. Sources have just told Eyewitness News the suspects in that horrible Greene County triple murder have been arrested. These people were already in Mexico. Uh, and in Mexico, there's a law you can't go more than, I think, it's 12 miles into the interior of the country without certain immigration documents. These people hit a checkpoint there. Uh, they didn't have the documents and were escorted back to the border. So they're coming back into the United States. Well, there are, there's a computer system. And the computer system, generally, they type in the uh, tag number and get other information. That computer system had not operated all day. It was not working. When that van that they were in, the Lily Lid van, pulled in to the stall there, to the gate, the computer system started working. When they typed in the, the uh, tag number, the BOLO came up. And, of course, notified them that these people were wanted for murder, that they were armed and dangerous, and they acted accordingly and did a fantastic job of apprehending them. But the computer had not worked all day long until right then when that van came in. Just like the hand of God again just came down and said, we're going to get you right here. After that, she got a pretty decent lawyer, you know, who was actually trying to help her, but it didn't do any good because in everybody's state of mind then, you know, they'd done read the newspapers, they'd done seen everything they wanted to see. You know, your first impression, you know how that goes, is it's a lasting one. How I got involved is I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And as cliche as that is, it's true. Ultimately, my proof boiled down to there only being one shooter reliably one shooter, and that was Jason Bryan. I think everybody would like to know who was responsible, directly responsible for what really happened on that road out there at Baileytown that night. Uh, I, would, I would like to know. I don't know that I will ever know, but I would like to know. Each one of them knows what they did. They know what the others did. They were going to be engaged in a situation where they were pointing blame at everybody else. Jason, they were going to point blame at Jason. Jason's going to turn around and start pointing blame at somebody else. So you're going to have, ultimately you're going to have finger pointing. They each know what they did. They know what the other one did. So they, as a group and as individuals, I'm assuming, they felt that this was the best thing. They acted as a group, they go down as a group. If she hadn't signed that plea bargain, then one of the other five kids might have went to trial and might have gotten the death penalty and it might have been one that hadn't had a part in it. And that was another major reason that she signed that plea bargain. Because they made it an all or nothing deal. Yeah. Every one of them had to sign it or none of them got it. But the problem with a lot of things around here is they just, they don't think children are that important, I guess. I deal with people all the time that kill people that are dangerous, but that doesn't mean that they're mentally ill, uh, as I understand mental illness, that they can't control what they're doing. I guess that's where I'm coming from, okay? that they don't have any control over what they're doing is my, would be my definition of mental illness in this conversation. I don't see that in these people. 
They knew exactly what they were doing. They intended to do it. They set out to do it. They did it, and they thought they'd gotten away. It would be much the better if uh, each of us individually would accept responsibility for what we do, and society as a whole would accept responsibility for what occurs uh, within its context. But if we accept responsibility for it, then we have to do something about it. I've stood here watching my world colliding with hell and did not stand in its way. I didn't worry of tomorrow or what would become of me. I will not condemn myself for feeling the way I do. For at least I do feel. <laughs>